a grave and shame is a robber and he's come to take my name love is my redeemer lifting me up from the ground and love is the power where my freedom song is found there ain't no
Oh! 
My sin was heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. But your love is the end.
There was a moment when the lights went out When death claimed its victory The king and love have given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sin Every curse is blood at home. One final breath and it was finished. But not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake. And the veil was torn. What sacrifice was made? As the heavens roar, we sing. 
the room. gathered here to to be in your midst to be in your presence we don't gather here as people mourning that our God is no longer alive without hope we actually gather this morning with this incredible hope and eternal hope that you are alive that our Savior lives and that today you are walking in our midst that your Holy Spirit is within us but also resting upon us and so we ask Holy Spirit that you would point us to Jesus this morning, that you would point us to truth, that you would set us free, that we would fall in love with you today in a greater measure. Jesus, we just gladly say that you are the King, and it's our joy to come under your rule and your reign. Have your way here this morning. Teach us who you are. It's in that powerful name we pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Hey, give somebody a fist bump and say, Jesus is risen. And while you're sitting down, can we give it up for our choir and our band for leading us this morning? Can we give them a round of applause, honor them? Man, whew, I feel like we could just go home right now, man. That was incredible church, right? Amen to that. Not quite though, almost. Don't say amen too loudly. You're going to hurt my feelings here. Hey, I hope you're having a great day today. It's not raining. It's so good, right? It's good to have you. We've got, this is our fourth service of the day. So man, we are just figuring out how to do this. So I'm glad that y'all came today. If you're a guest or whether you've been here for 30 years, I want to welcome you. My name is Derek. I have the privilege and honor of leading this incredible community of believers. And it really is an honor and a joy to do so. And I want you to know our heart. Uh, our heart is that today you would feel welcome for sure, that you would feel like, man, this, this feels different. But more than anything else, our prayer is always that, that we as a people coming together, we don't gather around a pastor. We don't gather around a band. We gather around the presence of the living King Jesus. And today, my heart is that you would encounter Jesus because when we encounter Jesus, everything changes. Everything changes. And today, we're celebrating this risen king, this victorious king. And so as we get started today, I want to get into the scripture and I want to read to you the the capturing of, of why we're actually here today. And so we know the story. You've probably heard the story. I'm sure you have that, that Jesus came to live among us, that he wrapped himself in flesh and lived the life just like you and I. He walked this earth. He got hungry. His feet got sore. He got, you know, all kinds of the same thing that we have. He was tempted in every way. Lived perfectly though, without sin. And, and then he was put on a cross, a criminal's cross, even though he wasn't a criminal. And he died. He took a very real last breath and yielded up his spirit to the Father. And then he was taken off the cross and he was put into a grave where a couple days he was down there in the dark, no pulse, no breath. But then there was a third day, amen? And today I wanna to read the scriptures of why we're gathering, why we're singing hell, King Jesus. So I want this to be fresh to you. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to, to make this come alive to you today, to give you some fresh revelation of who Jesus is and what that means to you. And so I'm gonna read from the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. This is what Matthew says about the, this incredible day in history. It says, after the Sabbath ended at the first light of dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to take a look at the tomb, the tomb where Jesus was. And suddenly the earth shook violently beneath their feet as the angel of the Lord Jehovah descended from heaven. Lightning flashed around him and his robe was dazzling white. The guards were stunned and terrified, lying motionless like dead men. Then the angel walked up to the tomb, rolled away the stone and sat on top of it. The women were breathless and terrified until the angel said to them, there's no reason to be afraid. 
I know you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen victoriously. Can somebody wake up and say amen this morning? The angel said, man, he is not here. He has risen victoriously just as he said. You see, he's faithful to fulfill his promises. He said, he's not here. He's risen. He's victorious. Come inside the tomb and see the place where the Lord was lying. Then run and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. I give you his message. I am going ahead of you in Galilee and you will see me there. They rushed quickly to tell his disciples and their hearts were in deep wonder and filled with great joy. Along the way, Jesus suddenly appeared in front of them and said, rejoice. They were so overwhelmed by seeing him that they bowed down and grasped his feet in adoring worship. And then Jesus said this, and I said this to him, and I want you to hear this. He said, throw off your fears. Anybody else sound like that's a good idea today to throw off some fears? He said, throw off your fears, go ahead and go and tell them in Galilee, they will find me there. So I love this picture of Jesus, the resurrected king, the victorious king. He says, throw off your fears. Now, why, why does Jesus say throw off your fears? How is he able? Well, we go back up and look what the angel said. He says, he says don't be afraid or, or throw off your fears. And what's he say? Because... He's not here. And so today we could talk about a lot of things. We could slice and dice this scripture. We could open up and I guarantee every church you go to, you're going to hear just a little bit different aspect of this victorious king today. But, but here's what I want to look at. I want to look at verse six. It says, he isn't here. He has risen victoriously just as he said. Today, I want to look at the victory of Jesus. Now, can we all just say victory today? Let's say it out loud. Victory. Now, like, act like you just won something, right? Let's say it together. Victory, right? Now, now I want to talk about victory. Victory is a supremacy in battle or supremacy in a, a physical contest. It means to overcome or to conquer. Victory. Now, I know, you know, volunteer fans, you don't know a lot about victories the last 20 years. And, uh, and so that's okay. And so this morning, I thought I would show you a picture. Now, I was remembering back of... Of, uh, yeah, it's already up, isn't it? Y'all already laughing. So I was thinking back to, to my days in sports and, and playing football and baseball and basketball and all those things. And, and, and I was reminiscing about my favorite moments were those when we won, of course, because I'm a very competitive person. And, but it wasn't just that we won, but that celebration with my teammates after a victory. And, uh, and this is a picture of my senior year. Uh, this was the last home game that we had at, a, at the Shoe. Uh, and we were playing in what many called the game of the century. The team up north, also known as Michigan. That's how much we don't like them. We don't like to say their name. Did somebody just say, go blue? Get out of my church. No, just joking. <laughs> we will pray for you specifically later. But we were playing the team up north. And, and I'm going to love to tell you a story because you know how this ends. So we played them. And, uh, and it was an incredible game, back and forth, back and forth. And at the end of the game, we won, go Bucks, 42 to 39, an incredible victory, incredible. And we celebrated up. And this is the picture right after in the locker room. This is my buddy, Antonio Smith. He's a great guy. He was the starting cornerback. He's also an incredible speaker. He's doing some incredible things up in Ohio. And, uh, and you see a couple of things, just observation, just as you learn uh, about how to take pictures. Number one, I forgot how, how ghetto I was. You see that head nod like there? Like, I'm like, what am I doing in that picture? Like, I don't even know. And then do you see this little creeper right behind my face here? Like, look at this guy right here. I have no idea who that is. I don't know how he got in the locker room. I don't know who he is. I'll, I'll tell you one thing. He had nothing to do with our victory. <laughs> but he was in the locker room celebrating. Doesn't that sound a lot like Easter? You had nothing to do with the victory. Yet this morning, you're invited to enjoy the spoils of the victory. And you can be the creeper in Jesus' <laughs> selfie. <laughs> I don't think Jesus would take a selfie, by the way. But if he did, you can be in that picture with him, right? Now, now in this picture, you see something about victory. Victory is all about conquering and taking over. So, man, we want to beat the other team into the ground. And we want to let them know about it. We want them to be hurting tomorrow morning when they wake up. And now, if you're a king and you're going into battle, you want to win. And so you want to take over territory. You want to kill your opponent. At the very least, victory sometimes for a warrior is just not dying, Right? But the victorious king that we're talking about today, the one that we just sang, Hail King Jesus, he had a different path to victory. His victory actually began with death. His victory began with taking a deep breath 
and never breathing again. His victory started by being put in a tomb, a cold, dark tomb, where nobody thought anything was going to ever happen again. And yet a few days later, the Spirit of God breathed into this dead carcass of a man and raised him back up to life. And in that moment, the dead king became the victorious king. And today, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about what does it mean that Jesus is the victorious king? What does it mean to you and to me that he has a victory? And I love how, how Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians. He, he gives us a beautiful picture of this. He says, but we thank God for giving us the victory. Who did Paul say that God gave the victory? Oh my goodness, y'all are awake. Y'all 1130, come on now. I said, he said, we thank God for giving us the victory. Who did he give the victory to? us, all of those that have trusted in Jesus. He says that Jesus gave us the victory through his life and through his death. And so you can be in the picture with Jesus, even though you didn't do anything. It's will you receive the victory today. Now, the question we should be asking is, is what victory are we talking about? And there's lots of victories that Jesus came to give us. But, but I want to talk about two specifically that I think impact our lives as we walk this earth today. Number one, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down, that Jesus gave us victory over sin. This victorious king. He came to give us victory over sin. Now, now that word sin, man, it's, it's a peculiar word. It's a word that, man, maybe you've heard people say, you know, bad things about people. You've heard people, you know, fire and brimstone. I just want to make sure we understand that sin is not just an immoral decision or an action. Sin is, sin is much bigger than that. It's, it's much wider than that. And here's what I want you to know about sin is that sin begins with a wrong belief and it ends with separation. So every time you think about sin, if, if you open up your Bible, which I hope you do sometime this week, this week and, and you read something about sin, what I want you to do is when you see the word sin, I want you to think about separation. Every time you see it, because this is the fruit of sin, it's separation. And it begins with a wrong belief about who God is. And so I think wrongly about God. I think something that's not correct about God. And as I think wrongly about God, I believe wrongly, I, I then sometimes will then believe something wrong about me, something that God never said. And as I think wrongly about God and I separate from the truth of who he is, and then I think about myself and I separate the truth of who he said I am, what ended up happening is I actually begin to act out wrongly. I separate myself apart from the way of God. And when I do that, guess what you and I do? You and I know this is true because we live it. What do we do? We then separate ourselves from God. This is what we do. This is what we see happen in the very beginning of the story of humanity with Adam and Eve in the garden. Eve is there in perfect togetherness with God and, and then Satan comes in and he comes in and he says, Eve, did God really say, if you touch this fruit, you'll immediately die? And he begins to cast some questions on what God said. And then he begins to pose this thought, this belief that, that maybe God is holding out on you because he doesn't want you to be like him. And he plants this seed of deception. Eve, God is holding out on you. What is that? That's a wrong belief about who God is. And that wrong belief about who God is that he's holding out then is triggered to, to now Eve Here's this, well, well Eve, you, you know, you're not good enough. And for the first time in humanity's history, a human has this thought, even though I'm made in the image of God, maybe he messed up when he made me. Maybe I'm not enough. And as she says, man, she sees this, maybe God's holding out, she, wrong belief about God, wrong belief about herself, maybe I'm not enough. She sees the opportunity to seize control and she takes and eats of the fruit and she hands it to her husband and he eats and what happens? They act out wrongly. And then what immediately happens? They separate. What do they do? They hide from God. Immediately, they separate themselves from God. I don't want to be with God. Let me hide behind this tree. Let me cover myself up. And why is that? Because sin is empowered by shame and guilt. And I think, I think if we're honest this morning, which I know it's in church, so sometimes it's hard to do that. But if we're honest this morning, we all resonate with this truth that sin is empowered by shame and guilt. Why did Adam and Eve feel like they had to hide? Because they were ashamed of what they've done. 
They were guilty and they saw that. And so what do they do? They separated from God. This is what Satan wants for you. This is his scheme against you for you to think wrongly about God, for you to think wrongly about who he says you are, for you to act out and in doing so, cover you with shame and guilt so that you separate from God, not God separate from you. You separate from God. This is what we see and this is sin. And listen, I can tell you that this has been a pattern in my life at Seasons where, man, I, I know the right things. Man, I was raised in church. I know the right things, but I find myself at certain seasons in my past that where I, I thought wrongly about God and about who I am. And, and then I begin to do some things that I know are not of God. And what do I do? I hide, I lie, and I blame others. This is how you know if you're operating with shame and guilt. You hide, you lie, and you blame others. We don't only isolate ourselves from God or insulate ourselves from God, but we also isolate ourselves from other people. This is the whole scheme of the enemy to isolate you so that he can speak lies over you so you would give up and run away from God. This is the plan of God. But thankfully, Jesus had a different way. See, Jesus came, and this is what we read in 1 Peter 3.18, that Christ suffered and died for sins once and for all. The innocent for the guilty. Christ, the innocent one the one without blemish, the one with no sin, he gave up his, sin, his life for the sinner, for the one who was guilty. It says the innocent for the guilty, and look what the purpose is. It's the purpose of the cross. It's the purpose of the resurrection, to bring you near to God. Everybody say near. 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 This is the purpose of the cross. It's the perfect purpose of the resurrection, to bring you near to God by the body of Jesus being put to death and by being raised to life by the Spirit. Now, as I was thinking and as I was preparing for this message this week, this phrase kept coming into my head, and, and I would love for you to write this down or remember this, that Jesus separates us from what separates us. I want you to think about this. We just talked about sin, how it leads to separation. Jesus came, died, took on our sin, became sin, so that we would not have to be separated from what separates us. His whole heart has been the whole time to bring you back, to bring you near, to cover up your shame, to cover up your guilt, to give you innocence and honor so that you could become all that he has desired to, for you to be. This is the hope that we have in Jesus, that he gives us victory over sin. But it's not just victory over sin that Jesus came, this victorious king. He swallowed up sin for sure, but he also came to offer us victory over hopelessness. And I don't know if you've read the news lately. Um, I don't know if you've read the international news or the national news or the political news. You can for sure find it there. Or, or honestly, if you've just seen some of the events that have happened the last few months in our community, I think we can all agree that hope is a scarce commodity here in our world. That, man, we really don't have a confident expectation of good things. That we are scared and we're trying to look for somebody to be the savior. And I want you to know that Jesus came to die and raise again, to restore our hope, to have victory over hopelessness. And this is what we see in 1 Peter 1.3. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, the resurrection of Jesus shows us there's no situation, no failure, no rejection, no darkness, no sin that can overcome God and his desire to be with you. What we see in Jesus that even in the darkness of death, even in the midst of his last breath, in that moment, he still trusted God and his hope was in the fact that there was gonna be a resurrection on the other side of the crucifixion. This was the hope that Jesus lived in and he doesn't just have it for himself. He wants to give you the same hope, this hope that we see in Jesus. This is what he wants us to offer, a living hope. Now, here's a couple of things that Jesus wants to give you this morning. He wants to give you a hope of life. Jesus says that I am the resurrection and the life, that whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Do you, do you understand the incredible truth in that, guys? Listen, as a pastor, I get to celebrate with people and give high fives and celebrate restored marriages and all that, but I also have the privilege of sitting with people when, when their loved ones are dying, when they're hooked up to a machine at the hospital and there's no way out. And this is what Paul says. He says, listen, guys, we don't mourn 
We don't, we're not anxious. We're not hopeless because our hope is in the fact that Jesus raised from the dead. That means that even in death, we don't actually die. We actually enter into life more abundantly. We actually become more aware of God and that in itself is eternal life, knowing him. And so we, as followers of Jesus, man, there, there is no fear of death. There is hope that even when we die, because Jesus went first and he entered into death and he rose up, that those that follow him, those that are in Christ, we also are gonna be resurrected and to live for eternity. This is our hope. We're not hopeless because Christ raised from the dead. He is walking and living and we have the same hope. And in Jesus, we have this incredible hope of forgiveness that no longer are we identified with shame and guilt and fear. No longer is our, our identity sinner and enemy of God. No longer is that the case. So Jesus swallowed up sin and the wrath of God so that he could change your identity from sinner to saint, from enemy of God to friend of God, from destined to death, to destined to life. This is the hope of the victorious King. And this is what he offers every person that would receive it. See, in Jesus, we have a hope that God can breathe life into any person, any circumstance, any situation, regardless of how dark it is. That in Jesus, we see the resurrection is a sign that everything is possible with God. There's no impossibility. And this is why we as a church, we believe that Jesus wants it to be impossible here. This is why we pray for the sick constantly. And we see God do incredible things, physically heal people often here. Why is that? Because God's a God of hope. That's why we pray for those that are, are riddled with anxiety. And I'm telling you, in a room this size, some of y'all are barely getting by because you're so anxious. And I'm telling you today, Jesus wants to give you peace. He wants to give you hope where there is no hope. This is why we pray for people that have marriages that are hanging on by a thread because we believe that Jesus gives hope that he can restore all things. See, the resurrection shows us that there is no final buzzer as long as we have breath in our lungs. Jesus is able. And what hope that Jesus gives us, this last hope, is that we have a living hope that we will reign victoriously with him for eternity. That it's not just today and now, but for eternity, we're gonna live with God. This is what the victorious king came to accomplish. To give us victory over sin, to give us victory over hopelessness, and to invite us in on this victory, to be in the picture with Jesus. Not anything you can do, nothing you can strive for, nothing you can try to earn, but just by receiving. This is the way of Jesus. And this is the good news. And this is why we celebrate him today. As we close here, we're gonna sing one last song here about the living hope of God. Before we do that though, we're gonna take just a moment to pray together. And remember prayer is not just a monologue where I just tell God everything. He wants to hear all your stuff for sure. But, but a big aspect of prayer is that we would just quiet ourselves and listen. And so we're just gonna pray together and we're gonna leave, some, leave a little space for us to allow the spirit of God to, to speak some things to us. And so if you're like me, I get distracted really easy. So you can close your eyes if you want to, you don't have to. There's nothing fancy about that or no formula with it, but I'm gonna invite you just to, to rest here for a moment before we sing this last psalm, before we get into the routines of Easter egg hunts and all that good stuff. Let's just quiet ourselves before the Lord. So Jesus, we, we recognize you. We, we proclaim that you are the King, that you are the victorious King, that you have no rival, that you gave us victory over sin and over death and over hopelessness. So Jesus, right now, I pray that you would just speak to us right now. What do you want us to know about your victory? What do you want us to know about your victory on the cross?